Hello and welcome to your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, January 13th, 2020. I'm Jer Stays. I'm Devin O'Reilly. Big show for you today. But before we get started, a big thank you to both Sean and Joseph for becoming members and supporting the show. Swag will be on the way this week. Members are what keep this show going. So join us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. That's patreon.com slash daily Detroit. And we've got a lot to do. So let's get started, Jer. Yeah, this is some late breaking news and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because we simply don't have the details, Devin. But I wanted to bring this to everybody as the Associated Press, one of the most reputable news sources that I know, is saying that former Governor Rick Snyder is going to be charged with crimes connected to the Flint water crisis back in 24-2015. A source has told the AP that the state attorney general's office has informed defense lawyers about indictments in Flint and told them to expect initial court appearances soon. Jared, it's huge news. And obviously, you know, this is something that is going to be with us for a while. The fallout is tremendous from the Flint water crisis. And even though it's been years, we're still obviously seeing major developments here. And this is a big one. Uh, We'll see what happens. Like you said, we don't want to speculate, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to come. All right, let's get into the pandemic. Statewide, we have new case numbers. We're looking at under 2,000 new cases reported Tuesday, bringing our total up to 525,612, an additional 100 deaths brings that sad number to 13,501 souls lost. I will stop here for a second and mention, Devin, under 2,000 cases, I mean, it's kind of sad that we're celebrating this, but also kind of great that we're under 2,000 cases for a daily number. Yeah, it's certainly trending in the right direction. You know, it wasn't that long ago, I believe in November, that we had hit, I think, 8,000 cases at one point per day. And so, you know, we've gotten that down to under a quarter of that. And again, though, for context, 1800, 1900 was about our high when we first started this pandemic back in March and April. 1800, I think, was one of the peak days. This is also comparable to the amount of cases we had when we thought it was the worst back in April. And compared to the nation, it's far ahead. I mean, you've got last time we talked, things haven't changed, Evan. Like things are still falling over in large parts of the nation. It is not a good situation. No, absolutely not. So again, movement is good in our regard. Um, There are places like California, like Florida, they're almost plateauing in terms of just staying at this incredibly high amount of new cases. One thing I wanted to talk about really quick is the city of Detroit's vaccine line, which we talked about on this very show, was overwhelmed on Monday with more than 100,000 calls In one morning when it opened, it seems a number of people did not get the memo about who is eligible or who had questions. I will say that our inbox is full of questions about vaccines and all of that kind of stuff. But to see that kind of uptake is and that kind of interest, I think a lot of people were worried that wouldn't be the case. But 100,000 cases. I think is a good sign for interest in the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. And and Jerry, I know something that is a problem and people want to know more about how this is all going to work, where we'll get the vaccines, how you'll be able to get them. Currently, there aren't many answers. I know it's a Herculean task to try and do this, um, but it's, you know, it's something that's going to be crucially important in terms of disseminating information to the residents of the city and the various cities on where they can go, how they can get a vaccination. Because again, I've seen in places like Florida on the news, it is a cluster blank (laughs) with people trying to get vaccines because they basically made it a free-for-all. A couple of quick news items before we get to the next things. More vaccines are on the way to Michigan. In what seems to be a reversal of Trump administration policy, the Health and Human Services Department granted a request for millions of doses that were being held back in the federal stockpile to be released to the states. This comes after a number of governors requested this happen, something we talked about on the show. It's interesting to see that they're doing this before the Biden administration takes over. Additionally, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has requested if Michigan can directly buy 100,000 doses from Pfizer. And that would be an interesting move if all of a sudden states start bidding up like they did for other things earlier in this pandemic. Yeah, it would be interesting. You know, it'd be unfortunate. I appreciate that Governor Whitmer is looking to to purchase an extra 100,000 doses for the state but you really don't want to have a situation where you've got bidding wars between states for vaccines. So I would much rather have this just handled at a federal level and have the the doses dispersed, you know, obviously on an as needed basis, obviously by population, maybe looking at factors like that rather than who can pay the most for them. Well, let's switch gears because an important piece of news has developed, especially near and dear to your heart, Devin, it's that the auto show is 
basically packing up for 2021, doing a smaller thing in Pontiac at the M1 concourse. And it's really a reimagining of the show. I know that you've got some thoughts on it, especially from an angle of Detroit businesses. Because uh, just so listeners know, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Voice I Trust, Eric Tritko, who is going to look at dealers and things like that. But I wanted to talk specifically about that downtown impact, that mobility impact, because, I mean, I think you can look at COVID as a, a driver for this, but also long term auto shows are changing. Yeah, I was incredibly disappointed to hear this. It's really, really unfortunate. And and like you said, Jer, it's twofold. What I'm hearing is it's really almost a 50-50 type of decision. Yes, COVID conscious decision to push it back and to not do any kind of large scale event like that, but also 50% or even more of it seems to be financial in, in, in the sense that they just aren't going to be able to get that level of sponsorship, that level of investment from the dealers, from the autos themselves, from the major sponsors. And I think that that was really the tipping point. Uh, more so than are we going to be able to do this from a health standpoint, I think the tipping point to cancel it was we're not going to financially be able to pull this off this year. And as you said, Jer, it's a much smaller thing. I want to be clear because a lot of people, I've seen some headlines, the auto show isn't moving to Pontiac. The North American International Auto Show is not happening this year, and Motorbella is happening in Pontiac. And I think that's an important distinction to make. It is an important distinction. Uh, Motorbella is a facility that a lot of gearheads really love. I hear that it is a very nice facility, but it is not the same as being in the middle of a city. And with auto shows changing, I'm very concerned about the economic impact. I mean, multiple reports, you know, $450 million, give or take, as far as the money goes. You've got so many hotels that have invested intentionally to be next to the TCF Center or whatever we're going to call it in the future. You've got the the traffic of all that. So there's really like two components to this. You've got the public show, which I know is not going to go away, right? People want to see cars. They want to try cars. But then there's also all the pre-stuff, the industry stuff. And those are the folks that are getting hotel rooms, throwing big parties, it's a lot of jobs and a lot of money tied into that. It's just so sad again because it's another blow to the local economy that will be felt. You know, one of the things that we were thinking about in terms of, you know, getting out of COVID, the light at the end of the tunnel were things like an auto show, things that were going to bring massive investment, visitors, people coming down here, uh, you know, safely being able to interact and spend their dollars. And now that we already know here in January that that's not going to happen all the way in September. It's incredibly unfortunate. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to find some ways. And I know that the, the mayor has kind of alluded to this already, but I'm hoping that we're able to find some ways to really spur some interest, investment, and activity in the downtown, into the Detroit area in light of the auto show not happening here. Well, you and I ran into each other in Capitol Park a couple days ago. And one of the things I think about is how awesome would that be as one of the vignettes for something like an outdoor auto show, something where you could actually have experiences. It's one of the most beautiful city-like blocks that we have that really feels like a big city and do something that's kind of a highly dense experience there. And I want to make sure that that happens because that would be good for all those surrounding businesses that have really like thrown in on Detroit and they need that traffic down there to, to keep things above board, above level. Yeah, I mean, the city really comes alive in the summer and in the warmer months as it is. And so having something that can attract people and can, again, get people back into, you know, you don't, you don't know exactly where we're going to be in terms of the pandemic, but you hope that, you know, in September, we're at a point where we're trying to really spur uh, patronization of local businesses, of uh, restaurants and cafes, things like that. There's a ton of them over there in the, the Capitol Park area, as there is throughout greater downtown Detroit. Um, so again, that's such another double-edged sword that we were looking forward to, you know, the first summer, the first warm weather auto show. And uh, it doesn't look like we're going to get that for another year. I think it's just a reminder that until we control the virus, we can't really have our economy back. No. And not only that year, but it, it also reminded us that things are going to fundamentally change. You know, I don't want to say forever. That's a big word, but for a long time, you know, large scale events like an auto show uh, may be changed forever. If you've been on social media at all, you know that General Motors has a new logo and it has caused quite the reaction. People are 
so very passionate about this change. Uh, the company says it was meant to evoke their planned electric future. The logo has rounded edges, lighter blues, and a lowercase GM with the M looking kind of like an electric plug. Uh, the reaction has been mostly against the change. I have a ton of thoughts, but Devin, I want to lay the cards on the table before we get started. In your day job, you deal with mobility companies and startups. You, you work near this space for the Detroit Regional Chamber, so you do not speak for them, but I know you have a front row seat for what's happening in the industry, and this logo is, it's a very visible sign of the times. Yes, you know, I was wholly unsurprised by this move and how the logo turned out. I actually like it. I know I'm in the minority, at least a vocal minority. I know the the vocal tends to be, the, the you know, get the, the loudest voice, but I actually like it and I, I totally understand what they're trying to do. And what I hope people understand is whatever shade you want to throw at the logo or you want to trash it or say what they needed, it should have done differently. The goal, the larger trend in the automotive industry is to behave and to look more like a startup. You're supposed to look like a tech company, behave like a high tech company. Everybody wants to be not only Tesla, but they want to be Facebook. They want to be, um, you know, LinkedIn. They want to be, um, they want to be high tech companies. And so, to make this change, people who are saying, "Oh, well, GM's logo now looks like it's uh, it should be an app on an iPhone." That's the point. Mm. That's what they were going for. So in that case, they achieved what they were trying to do. And I think people have to understand and get that headset around. They're looking towards the future. Their brand value is going to be tied to how much people perceive them as a forward thinking, you know, future minded, next generation of energy type of company. That's what it's going to be about rather than, you know, do we have a nice traditional logo that people are familiar with? Those consumers are becoming less and less. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that the old GM logo was any sort of design award winner by any stretch of the imagination. The new one I'm torn on because I totally get what you're saying. And I'd actually like to dive into, before we get into those thoughts, what is the reasoning behind this startup change or this thought change, because it is very difficult and very cognitively dissonant for many listeners that I have talked to and, and other people around the area where it's like, wait a second, but this company's a hundred years old. I think about big metal. I think about strong and all these other things. What is the incentive for that? And what is really driving that industry? I mean, I don't want to be too kind of broad or obtuse, but I mean, we are in the age of kind of big technology and the stuff that you just mentioned, you know, U.S. Steel, GE, how are those brands doing? They're dinosaurs. They're they're being mothballed. They're collecting dust. And the automotive companies don't want to be that. When you talk about the recent news, you know, Tesla and Rivian and Apple's going to create a car these automotive companies have to keep up not only from a manufacturing standpoint, which they have the advantage in manufacturing, what they don't have is the branding advantage and the technology advantage. And that's what they're trying to get a leg up. That's what they're trying to partner with high tech companies. And, you know, the perceived value of companies now is tied to the Silicon Valley model more than it is the Rust Belt model. And that's just the way it is. So, you know, I hear people a lot anecdotally say, you know, the Tesla valuation right now is ridiculously high. And I'm sure a lot of Tesla fans will get on me for this, but it's ridiculously high. And if you look at just the paper to paper without the logo on it, you know, General Motors would be three times as valuable if it was just called Apple or if it was called Rivian <clears throat> or something because people see GM and perceive that value as lower because it's seen as a, uh, you know, slow to change type of a company. Well, we're in a national and international marketplace. And although there is a lot of affinity for those things here. I think we have to be realistic in how the rest of the world uh, perceives those brands. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. And I think that also it's something that globally, it makes more sense because again, with the EV focus, I mean, there's no doubt about it. The change in this General Motors logo is, you know, a huge nod to the advancement and the proliferation of electric vehicles and what they're going to try and do and have an all electric fleet. That's something that's much more palatable and much more interesting to a European, for instance, an Asian market. In America, we love our gas guzzlers, and it's just really hard for us to understand a future where all the cars are electrified. But again, I have to say, it's one of those things where technology usually wins, Jer. And at the end <laughs> of the day, the electric vehicle technology is going to be superior to anything that a combustible engine can put out. So it's not a matter of the stereotype that, Oh, my F-150 that's it's uh, runs on combustible engine. It can haul more, it can drive faster, it's more powerful than your EV. 
That's false or going to be false. The electric vehicles are going to be able to pull more, go faster, more torque, zero to 60. And they're just going to be superior vehicles. And I think I know it's scary. I know it may be a hard truth for people, but that's happening. Well, and it's going to have large economic repercussions because electric vehicles don't need oil changes. They don't need as much maintenance. There's just a whole host of things. But back to the logo, I'll make this point. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I think that it was executed poorly. Like at the basics of it, I can get behind the renderings that I keep seeing with all the bevel and the shine, I'm not digging it, but that's a personal preference. Yeah, I, I know. I, I had a little bit of a question about the shine. I didn't quite like that, but then they explained that it was to represent the clean air future that you know electric vehicles are going to bring, so I get the intentionality behind it. Also, did you watch the video? I think the video also helped. They had a little kind of hype video that went along with it, and I think it helped explain kind of where they're going and showed some of the cool technology that they're going to be able to do with, with batteries, and it gave you a little bit more uh, buy-in, hopefully. But As far as feedback from others go, I want to pull out something that I see as a theme over and over again. I saw it on our Facebook page. I've seen it everywhere. It's this idea that lowercase letters somehow make you less masculine. I see this over and over again, and I think it's stupid. Like, it doesn't define how manly you are or not manly or whatever you want, depending on, like, whether you're uppercase or lowercase. To see that thread over and over again, to see that about it being masculine was really telling to me, and and often it was done by people who were frankly older than me. It certainly seems naive. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm looking at my iPhone right now, and all of the multi-billion dollar company apps that are on my iPhone, I see an awful lot of lowercase letters, uh, whether that's you know LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. So I don't know. Again, that's, that's a trend. So I just, I don't get that uh, assertion. I think that you can be whatever you want to be, And I don't think that your uppercase or lowercase or what color shirt you wear uh, determines how manly you are. But maybe I'm of a different generation. But, you know, if you're someone who is just tied to your gas guzzler and you don't want anybody to take that from you, I have some good news for you. It's not like tomorrow we're putting all the combustible engine vehicles out of commission and you're only going to be able to ride electric. That's not the case. If you are 45, 50 years old or older, you will never have to ride in an electric vehicle, okay? So let's not get crazy. You can always have your your gas guzzling truck or whatever it may be. You are in no danger. (laughs) Make sure we say that. Well, let's get, as you are the man about town, let's get to some stories. First off, uh, there's some news in my inbox about the Transfiguration School Rehabilitation that will be 100% affordable apartments and homes Uh, That is actually over in the Banglatown neighborhood, and that is going to be right around the corner of McNichols or Six Mile and Mound Road. I actually visited this old church building. It's a school building that was connected to a church. It was built in 1926 to serve the Polish population. But for a while now, it's been kind of out there to have an RFP to get redeveloped. The news is that developers broke ground on a $7.2 million plan to turn the former Transfiguration School into affordable housing. All of the units uh, will be available at 60% of the average median income, which is how they define affordability, and uh, multiple layers of financing. Uh, This is a pretty big deal in that it's good to see not only historic rehab, but to see that this project is moving forward. I believe it's actually with... uh, Sinair Solutions and Ethos Development Partners. You know, development that comes outside of downtown, that's always cool to see. It's a continuing narrative that I hope people understand and catch on to that, you know, there are developments outside of what you see in the 7.2 square miles. There's a lot of cool stuff happening. It may not be the $100 million plus developments, but even stuff like this, $7.2 million um, that's going to be developed in Banglatown. Uh, also Hamtramck. And that's something whenever I see stories about Hamtramck or Banglatown, I, I always kind of think uh, I'm actually naive where I don't know where the overlap lies. I know sometimes they're used in place of each other. Obviously, that was a huge Polish population when it was Hamtramck. I know that um, the Bangladeshi population has just surged in the area and really helped to revitalize it. Um, and so I know that there's a lot of overlap there, but I'd like to know more about what Banglatown versus Hamtramck in terms of um, where's the overlap there and you know what businesses are in each area. I think we should do an episode on it. And if any of our listeners know things or have links, uh, be sure to send me them because I would love to do something more on that. I think this diversity is something that is just really helps make a region in an area strong. 
Yeah, absolutely. I hope we can uh, crowdsource some listeners on this. I know there's some that are in the in those areas or know more about those areas. I don't get a chance to spend as much time there as I as I used to, especially now that we can't go to Painted Lady and Whiskey in the Jar and Short X Market and Polish Village and all the places I can name. <laughs> but I'd like to know a little bit more about how uh, Banglatown plays with that and how Hamtramck and Banglatown are the same, are not the same, and kind of that Venn diagram. Well, this next one is a continuation of Bedrock's Decked Out Detroit Initiative those pergolas, all that other stuff. It seems like they're upping it another level. They're going to be doing this drive-in movie theater experience temporarily on the site of the Monroe Blocks. Uh, that, that's a development that's been kind of like stalled with everything in the economy and, and demand and all that stuff. That's right next to Campus Martius. But uh, this is interesting news, and this is actually going to happen pretty quickly. It's going to first start uh, January 22nd and be run along with Imagine theaters. Devin, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, this is great. This is, uh, again, uh, I wouldn't say surprising, but like you said, Jerry, it's already happening uh, within just uh, just over a week here that they're going to be able to launch this. I think it's a fantastic use of, again, kind of a, I would want to say shelved development, but I know there just hasn't been a lot going on with, with Monroe Blocks, especially with you know, the Hudson site and even, you know, finishing off the book tower. It was a massive, massive undertaking that I think that Bedrock has kind of just you know, put put on the back burner for now. And so you have this huge space in the middle of uh, downtown Detroit that actually was being used as a parking lot. So perfect repurpose. They're going to turn that into essentially a pop-up drive-in movie theater that Imagine Theaters can then kind of run for the city. The infrastructure is there to do it. Uh, I would imagine the demand is there to do it. So I think it's a great idea. And it looks like they'll sell tickets. And then not only that, but you'll be able to order food and drinks from local restaurants and uh, and vendors in the downtown area. And so another way to kind of spur some uh, local patronization. Drive-in movie theaters have seen a huge resurgence over the last year. And I would encourage people to check this out, but also check out some of the OG movie theaters. Take a drive if you're going to, or go to the Ford Wyoming. I will say that uh, what we're going to see on the 60 by 32 foot digital projection screen it looks like they're going to go with older movies. This will not be first run stuff. Uh, the first three nights starting January 22nd, Devin, I want to do a quick poll of you. Which of these three movies would you want to see first? So Friday, the 22nd is Jurassic Park. Saturday is Shrek. And Sunday is Back to the Future. Which one are you signing up for? Wow. Wow. Okay. So this is tough. Shrek's going to come in third. I'm just not of that generation. 100%. Um, I'm, sh- I'm sure it's a fine movie. If I had kids, it might be different. I don't. I love the other two, but Jurassic Park is one of my, I mean, you could ask my top five movies of all time and it's, it's very possible Jurassic Park would be in there. I saw it in the movie theaters in 92. I think it came out. I was a dinosaur loving kid and yeah, Jurassic Park. All right. Well, see, I'm going to differ with you. I agree with the Shrek position. But for me, I'm going to go with Back to the Future. Can't hate that. Uh, Back to the Future is uh, just amazing. I don't think Jurassic Park aged as well over time. How dare you, Jer? What do you mean by that? The The dinosaurs look like rubber puppets now. They still look very real to me. You watch that Velociraptor scene in the in the kitchen and you tell me your heart is not still pounding. Okay, it definitely does. There's no doubt about that. No, I, I appreciate it. And then finally, I wanted to stop off in the suburbs because I know how many people want us to make sure that we cover suburban stories and especially the inner ring suburbs where we know we have so many listeners in Dearborn. They have a new initiative and and something near and dear to my heart, a new coffee window. I think walk up coffee windows are the future of coffee, but that's just me and my personal bias. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I appreciate we get a chance to talk about some cool stuff that's happening outside and in some of the inner ring suburbs, uh, as you said. And uh, we talked about downtown Detroit doing the the pergolas and the igloos and things like that. It's also important to know uh, Dearborn is doing those as well. So downtown West Dearborn, uh, that Michigan Avenue corridor is doing a lot of the igloos. The city has kind of committed to helping those businesses put some tents and igloos and stuff. So if you're on Michigan Avenue, just behind kind of the the block behind, there's tents, igloos, some of the local businesses, Mint 29, uh, Modern Greek, Blue Sushi. There's a few different other restaurants. They're all kind of collectively have a, a space back there. And so it'll be really cool. 
see some igloos over there. You'll be able to dine outside and still be relatively comfortable. And then, yes, there's a new coffee shop, Black Box Coffee, that's not only a coffee shop, but also an art gallery. And so they're actually doing a call for local artists, for local art, for their gallery. It will be open. Um, I know that they kind of just opened up in the pandemic, which we know is tough. And Jerry, you mentioned right now they have a walk-up window where you can get all of their offerings. And then eventually they'll be able to kind of open this uh, socially distant gallery that they'll have that'll have local artists. But it's a really cool thing to see. And it's all part of that area that was uh, really redeveloped by Ford Motor Company um, just on Michigan Avenue and Monroe and that block. And so it's a really cool area. It's been built up a ton. If some, if people haven't been over there in even a year, you'd be really surprised at the level of activity and new businesses that are over there. Well, Devin, it has been quite a journey on today's episode, but uh, it's been a fun one, man. It's good to have you. Yeah, we... <laughs> Had some great conversations, like you said, Jerry. It really ended up with a lot of news, and I'm glad we got to talk about it. For sure. Well, until next time, Devin O'Reilly, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram, D Riles, D Space Riles on Instagram. Check me out there uh, in my About Towning. And I'm Jerry Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit. <laughs>